Higher. Ew. Rando. Listen. Engage. Kasafti. Henry Fioli. Represent. a 19th century uh, pastime called pedestrianism where people used to walk for hours or days on end. This drew large crowds and large wages. The popularity grew then in 1866 the first English amateur walking championships were held which was judged by the fair heel and toe rule which is a precursor to the modern day rules. Then in 1880 um, the original in uh, English amateur athletics um, event uh, took place and race walking was one of the original disciplines. Then in 1904 it was part of the Olympic all-rounder event and within the next Olympic cy cycle it became a standalone event. Actually contested in two different distances, 3,500 metres on the track and then 10 miles on the road. Unfortunately this was men only and it remained that way into 1992 where the women were added with a 10k walk in um, the Olympics. So fast forward a number of years and we, we see lots of changes throughout the distances within the walks. There's been 20K, 50K, which is what we have now, but we've also had 10 miles, 3K, all the different things in the Olympic events. So 2021 Tokyo Olympics will be 20K and 50 kilometers. Unfortunately, it'll only be women in the 20K and not in the 50. The women's walk has managed to, the women's 50K has managed to make its way up to the world champs, but unfortunately not the Olympics yet. And it looks like it's, that's never going to be the case as a recent announcement has confirmed that the 50K will cease to exist in the Olympics after this year. So the race. So when you finally get involved and you actually race, what are you looking to expect? So the race walk races are on both the road and the track. When you're on the road, it's normally a 1k or a 2 kilometer route. Um, so this is to aid in the judging. The senior international distances are, as I've already hinted to, 20 and 50 kilometers. But your age group distances are 1k under 13, 3k under 15, 5k under 17 and 10k under 20. So as you can see, every single age group we jump up, we almost double our distance. Um, this is a bit of a problem for us because it means that our retention rates uh, are a little bit low. They are low across all athletics and uh, endurance in particular. But yeah, we really do struggle because there's a, unlike with the running events, if you're a good 800 metre runner, you can remain an 800 metre runner for your entire career. But unfortunately with the walks, if you're a good 1K walker, you're going to have to be a good 20K walker eventually if you want to if you want to stay stay up there um, at senior level. However, do not panic. Uh, there are numerous domestic opportunities from anything from as short as one mile all the way up to 100 miles. So if you want to give it a go, there's definitely a distance for you. And actually, there's some really good um, high class competition within the UK. Um, so Welsh senior champs and British senior champs both host 5,000 metre walks. So if you're a junior trying to move up the ranks or just someone who's recently converted, then there might be an opportunity for you to race at a high level before you've mastered that 20K. So once you've got yourself up there in the mix, what are the representation opportunities? From a Welsh point of view, we've got Welsh schools, junior and senior European Opens, which Welsh Athletics likes to send teams to. And then the pinnacle for us is the Commonwealth Games, the next Commonwealth Games being Birmingham 2022. Then from a GB point of view, we've got the European and World Race Walking Team Championships, formerly known um, as the Cup Championships. Um, and then we've got the European and World Champs and the Olympics. So what is the picture? So the current um, world 
British or Welsh picture? What are athletes doing? What have you got to aspire to? So race walking is truly a global event with medalists, uh, with medalists making the podium from lots of different countries and lots of different continents. So our current 20K world record holder is from Japan, uh, Suzuki, so 76.36. Our female 20K record holder is Lu Hong, um, 84.38. And our male 50 kilometer record holder is from France and with three hours 32 33. From a British point of view Tom Bosworth is our 20k men's record holder and his PB is 79 38. Jo Atkinson is our women's 20 kilometer record holder and her PB is 90 41 and then from a 50 point of view it's Chris Maddox with three hours 51. So what about Wales? So we're obviously here as Welsh Athletics, so hopefully we've got a lot of Welsh people, people tuning in. So from a Welsh point of view, um, we're not quite up there with the, uh, with the top in the world, but we're not too bad. Uh, Steve Barry, uh, his 20k record set back in the 80s, so quite a while ago, was 82.51. Um, my, I hold the 20k women's record, which is 91.53, and Bob Dobson is 4 hours 11 for 50k from a medal point of view, because everyone likes to know about the shiny, the shiny things. 30 kilometer gold uh, in the Commonwealth Games in 1984 for, by Steve Barry. And well, that was out in Australia. And actually we seem to do very well in Australia as Welsh, because uh, I managed to win a bronze in 2018 on the Gold Coast in the 20K. From a current senior Welsh international point of view, um, Heather Lewis and I ha are up there. Uh, there might only be two of us, but we've been pretty consistent, um, not doing too shabby. We've managed to be within the top three in the UK for probably the last five to eight years. Uh, and between us, we've ticked off all the opportunities to race internationally for Wales and Great Britain, apart from the Olymp Olympics. So fingers crossed we managed to, to tick that one off soon. Um, and then from a junior point of view, we've had some really strong juniors, but mainly in the lower age groups, we have a real problem with transitioning. So the only athlete to successfully transition has been Heather. Um, so she was a really good junior international and now is obviously a very, very good senior international. We've got a couple of athletes currently going through transition. So fingers crossed they make it. Um, and then from a coach point of view, so our only race walk specialist uh, coach uh, based in Wales is Martin Bell, who is obviously on this call. Um, so we're really looking to encourage more coaches to think about coaching the event if they've got a large uh, endurance group to start including or encouraging their athletes to, to really seriously consider it. So this big gap, um, so you're talking almost the 10 year age gap between Heather and myself and, and our next kind of uh, person to fill our, our shoes. Um, means big opportunities. So if you're really, if you're thinking of having a go, then please, please do uh, take it up. Um, and I'm talking any age. Um, and from a Welsh point of view, we're particularly interested in getting some male athletes because there are lots of spaces on teams. Um, but you don't have to be junior, like I said. So this picture is of the Commonwealth Games podium, and both Alana, who's in the New Ze the Black of New Zealand, and myself didn't find race walking properly until our 20s so it just goes to show that you can really start at any age and and do do all right <laughs> so the rules the thing that we as race walkers probably talk about the most uh it is the biggest difference between running and walking so the IAAF defines race walking as a progression of steps with no visible loss of contact with the ground and the athlete's advancing leg must be straightened from the first contact with the ground until the vertical upright position. So the loss of contact uh, part is to the human eye. So you're looking at a contact lower than 0 0.04, 0.04 seconds, anything longer than that, and you can see it. So when we get shown on TV sometimes, the slow motion cameras, or sometimes with um, high speed pictures, you do see slight flight phases, but as long as it's under that 0.04 uh, time limit, then you're all right. And then the second part of the rule, the straight leg part, is probably the most important um, part, or the biggest difference between running and walking, because you can be your a runner who is who is basically always on the ground, so a bit of a shuffle runner, but you can't be a bent-legged race walker. 
judging. So how is it judged? So there are at least four judges based around a track or a course, and then usually also a head judge. So they're dotted around and they'll have on their persons that have yellow paddles. So as you can see, there's a picture here. So the little squiggly line, that is a yellow warning paddle for the contact part of the rule. And then the arrow, that is referring to the straight leg part of the rule. So if a judge sees you and they think you're in danger of breaking the rule, they'll be showing you these warnings. A really important thing to remember is a warning. You want to you want to be friendly with the judges. Um, they're trying to help you out. If they're showing you a warning, that's because they want you to improve. They really don't want to give you that red card. So if you see if you get a yellow warning, take the advice on board and try and improve. If unfortunately you don't improve, uh, and the next time you pass them, they think you've definitely broken that rule, they will write you a red card, and that gets sent to the head judge. They confirm it, and it gets put on what we affectionately call the naughty board. Um, so there's this big board, and it'll be keeping track of who's got what red cards. If you have three red cards from three separate judges, you get put into a pit lane. A pit lane is like a time penalty place, um, and depending on your length of race, it's a uh, five minutes for 50 kilometers, 30 seconds for 5k. Um, so you serve your time penalty before being released back onto the track where you have an opportunity to finish the race off. Unfortunately, if you receive a fourth red, you are disqualified, um, which no one wants. Um, it's something to bear in mind is if you're a uh, doing a really short race and maybe a mile or you're in some of the lower age groups the pit lane might not be used because the shorter races it's really difficult to include that time penalty so if you're in a race that doesn't have a pit lane you need to watch out because the third red will be the disqualification rather than the fourth so it's really important that you as an athlete or as a coach learn from the officials please go up and have a chat to them afterwards find out why it is you've got that warning or that red um, and then put a plan together uh, for your athletes or for yourself in order to react a little bit better in future and hopefully avoid future disqualifications. I think the rules is probably one of the most daunting parts of um, starting on your race walking journey. I've met lots of athletes that get really nervous about it and uh, really worked up. What I like to do is to do specific uh, sessions to just before their first race or, or any race that they're worried about where um, the athlete will race walk down race walk around do their normal training session and i'll, I'll whip a, a warning paddle in their face um, or shout at them telling them they've got a certain red card so they try and then improve their technique in order to avoid any further infringements so on that um, i personally have a response to cards plan so that's something that you as a coach can work with uh, your athletes to have or you as an athlete can work on yourself so for me if I get a warning or a red for contact then I will think about am I in control uh, am I pulling through on the ground I really think about that contact and then if I get a warning or a red um, for knees I think about getting my toe up so it's very very individual and um, different athletes will respond differently to different cues and and kind of different vis visualizations so it's definitely worthwhile having a sit down and and talking through this and finding out what works best for you and the next thing to say is disqualification is basically a rite of passage for race walking every single race walk athlete you know out there has probably been disqualified at least one point in their in their race walking careers it is heartbreaking i'm not gonna lie i i've got a really vivid memory of my first world competition where i was so overwhelmed going into it um you know gp vest super excited people from everywhere um and i was just like i, I didn't didn't feel like i belonged and i went off like a rocket got stuck in the wrong group and by five uh, 5k i'd received a third red and and got dragged off the course and i i came off the course and i kind of collapsed in a heap in tears on on the side so definitely really really traumatic for me um but my partner he gave him a bit of a kick and said come on pull yourself together so very thankfully did that because maybe i'd still be there but no it's really important that you uh, understand that it is part of the event and it's all about how you pick yourself up and build on that and hopefully uh, improve in future so the techniques so how does that uh, the rules relate to the techniques so what we're after um i'll just move this little floating box so i can see it's in the way of that picture 
Uh, so what we're after is your shoulders to be relaxed and square to the front. Your arms want to be moving at a 90 degree angle, chest to pocket, opposition to the legs to balance it out. Your front foot wants to be planted with the toes up and you want to be in a relaxed, full upright posture. So with no bend at the waist. Your leg needs to be straight at contact and remain straight until the vertical and you want to have a strong pull through so race walking is a really a pulling action and then a strong push off the rear foot um, so there's some pictures on the side here of me um, so as you can see my arms are in a nice 90 degree angle well done myself um, my shoulders are square to the front nice upright posture um, that front leg is out straight, ready to, for when it gets contact with the ground and it's remained straight as I've pulled it through. Um, and I'm going to show you a video of that in a second. But if you, the technical model can be improved through drills, cueing, strength and conditioning and overall fitness. So lots of ways to improve your technical model. And obviously for race walking, it's absolutely vital. And I know there's lots of runners out there who probably could do with working on their technical model but choose not to but for us if we don't have that technique uh, in a good place we obviously risk disqualification and risk not being able to showcase all of our hard work and training so coaches out there athletics 365 is a fantastic resource um, for all these different parts of the technique there's that it's broken down into stages and they've got like a color-coded system that you can get your athletes to work through all the way up to gold standard so this is a video of me, nice slow motion video, so you can see it in action. So, ta-da, race walking. <laughs> So as you can see, my shoulders are square to the front, my arms are at a 90 degree angle, nice upright posture, leg is straight on contact and remains that way until I push strongly off. I'll show you one more time, just in case you've never seen it before, but hopefully you all have. So oh, that's the first section done. So uh, now we'd like to invite you to ask us any questions on that first part. Um, just to let you know, in the next two sections, we're going to be going through cueing, drills, um, strength and conditioning, and like the session slash physiology of race walking. So if you want to keep your questions to what we you've just seen, um, that'd be really good. I'm just going to pop this open so I can now see you all. So does anyone have any questions? I don't know, Liz, whether you want to take over now. There's nothing in the chat at the moment. Everybody's gone quiet, Beth, because you've obviously explained everything uh, very well. Um, yeah, we'll give you, a, give you a few seconds, guys. If you want to ask any questions on anything Beth has just been through, um, don't be shy. No, no question is a bad question. We'd rather, as I said, this, we wanted to make this. Uh, the reason we did this kind of uh, session on Zoom was to try and make it a little bit more interactive because we're... Race walking tends to be quite a small community. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that people had the opportunity to sort of, you know, ask questions and, yeah, and interact really. So give you a few seconds. If nobody steps in, I will let Beth and, uh, um, yeah, carry on basically. Have you got anything to add on that, Martin? Uh, oh, just the one thing I was going to say, picking up on Beth and thing about, oh, really work on the technique what as an athlete as a race walker you have to constantly work on your technique it's no good working on it getting to your first race getting through thinking that's it i've done it i'm now able to do it i got through i've got no cards i've got no warning i didn't get disqualified as you get fitter as you get faster you need to adapt your technique to allow you to adapt to your fitness levels and the speed that you're walking at so you constantly have to go back and refresh your technique and work on that the whole time. Get the basics right, and then keep on working to fine tune that as you get fitter and faster. But yeah, so it's something that walkers have to do almost constantly is go back to the basics and let, relearn the technique almost month by month, week by week, certainly annually. I mean, it was something I did every year. My start of my training year was technical work for one month every year. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree. It's a bit of a, it's almost a bit of a catch up game. So your, your fitness and your technique tend to do this all the way through your career. So yeah, Martin is, is right. It's, it's something that we always have to work on.
and we ha and it's absolutely vital like i've already said um runners get away with it you know we do see some very shocking technique at the top level within the running world but in race walking you know you, you have to be on it and you have to be on it every second of the race for as long as almost four hours if you're going to do 50k Great, thank you, Bethan. I will let you carry on with the, the next part of the presentation. Okie dokie. So the next section, um, talking about the cues. So I've just talked about what a good technical model looks like. So what happens if your athlete or you yourself um, aren't quite hitting those, those, that strong technical model. So posture, so we've already said you need to have a relaxed upright position, so no bends at the waist. So if you start bending at the waist, stuff you can say to an athlete to try and uh, cue that would be keep tall, chin up, look ahead. Um, from a straight leg point of view, so if, you're, if an athlete is kind of displaying a bit of a soft knee or a definite bend in the knee, things you can say to them is toe up or pull through. So by saying toe up or pull through, you're kind of forcing your leg into a, a straight position. Uh, another way to help with straight leg is, is actually posture itself. So one thing you see when an athlete's starting off is they're looking at their feet a lot. I think uh, you get really worried, I think, because it's uh, obviously slightly different to, to normal walking or running. Um, athletes tend to be staring at their feet, staring at knees, wondering whether they're doing it right. And by doing that, that me ends up meaning that they're really low to the ground, their posture is terrible, and they just don't have the space to let their legs fully straighten. So, so another way to kind of cue keeping your legs straight is to say, keep tall, chin up, look ahead. Um, when it comes to maintaining contact, I mean, this is a little bit more unusual when athletes are first starting out because uh, the, their technical model is not quite there and kind of stops them from really reaching those top speeds that, that allow for, for lifting or loss of contact. But, you know, as soon as an athlete goes into a race, um, they can get quite bouncy. So things to say to them would be keep low and pull through. Um, and then arms. So if their arms are very close to the chest or, or flailing all over the place or, or whatever they're doing with their arms. So arms are really important in race walking, uh, probably more so than running because you're really powering with your arms. So definitely want to get those arms moving in the, in the right way. So little cues you can say are drive back, elbows in, chest to pocket or pull the rope. I quite like pull the rope because I imagine it, it from like hip height. So that's really nice way. And also pull the rope. I, 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 my arms tend to extend which helps with lengthening my stride um, so a key coaching tool is simply filming so getting your mobile phone out taking a video of yourself or your athlete and then either just watching it back real time or popping it into an app like Huddle Technique, for example, is something I use quite a lot. So you're able to slow down uh, through different speeds and really kind of zone in on on what it is that that the athlete is doing. Um, and you're able to layer it up. So if, as you can see on the screen, I've, I've done a bit of a print screen of what I can do on Huddle Technique. So you can, you can layer up in race compared to training. Um, so really see what, because the environment within a race is very, very different with training. There's problems that you could never have in training with your technique, but as soon as you get into a race situation, um, they start to kind of pop up. Um, so yeah, so it's definitely filming it is a really good way to manage that. And also it's a great way for your athletes to see what it is that you're cueing. Um, because sometimes when a coach says to you, your leg isn't straight and you're like, well, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, and then they show you a video and you're like, ah, okay. So yeah, so video footage is a really way, a really good way of making kind of raising that awareness level within your athletes. And also right now, obviously we're all we've all been pushed into virtual coaching um so i'm actually distance coach so my coach andy drake is based up in leeds so i use um video footage as a bit of a lifeline really so he can keep an eye on on my te technical model um even though he's on the other end of the country so this is something that i've obviously used for a, a good number of years but yeah now if you're being forced into virtually coaching an athlete this is a really really useful tool So I'm now going to move on to some drills. So I've chosen four drills. There's way more than four race walking drills, but we, we're trying to be whistle stop tour, remember? Um, so another thing to add about drills, athletes will benefit from not only, I mean, when you're first starting out doing the race walk drills, 
are, are really useful to really hone hone and nail down that race walk technique however athletes will benefit from doing running drills as well so if you're a, an endurance coach and you've got a, a large endurance group and you may have one uh, one race walk athlete and the rest are runners there's no harm in mixing it up so maybe one week doing running drills one week doing race walk drills and actually you might find that one of your runners uh, might be really really good at the race walk drills and that might be a good opportunity to convince them to swap across um, they might have lots of potential in the event and would have never realized before this and if you're an athlete yourself and you're kind of training alone on the fringe this is a really good way for you to jump in with with a, a group and just ask if you can start doing the warm-up and I'll explain a little bit later about joining in with sessions themselves. So the first drill I'm going to talk about is to uh, help to improve posture. So remember we're looking for a relaxed upright position, no bend at the waist. So I'll show you the drill and then I will talk through it. So the athlete has uh, set herself up, nice tall upright position, got her, her pelvis in a, a good place. She's extended her arms and she's raised her palms to the ceiling. It's a bit like an aeroplane. We call this aeroplane drill, really. Um, so her palms are facing up because that really helps to pull the chest up and keep you tall. So I'll show it again. So some of the cues you can use with this are keep tall, chin up, look ahead. So as you can see, race walking, but with her arms nice and wide, keeping nice and tall. So the next drill is foot roll. So this is really good for helping with maintaining contact. So you're really trying to get your athlete to utilize every single part of their foot. Um, I will show you it. It's a quite a slow one. So it's all about control with this one. So as you can see, I'm landing on my heel and I'm rolling all the way through to my toes. Ignore my arms, but uh, my feet are all right. <laughs> So cueing here, heel to toe, toes up, roll low. So you really want to think about that contact and utilizing every part of your foot. So the next drill is the low foot swing drill. So this one is a really nice one. Again, this, this helps with maintaining contact. So I know a lot of athletes that kind of do a version of this within races themselves. So if they've got a warning for um, contact or, or they've got a red for contact, they do a version of this past the judges to kind of be like, hey guys, I'm definitely on the ground. So what, this, what you're listening to and watching is an athlete basically scraping their foot on the ground. So have a listen and watch. So your athlete is race really walking as normal, but they're trying to swing their leg through really, really low and basically taking the bottom layer off their shoe. Um, and if they can hear it, they're doing it right. So I'll have another look and a listen. Great way to wear in the shoes, this one. Uh, and then the fourth drill I'm gonna show you is uh, the active step drill also known as pull the rope. So this one is really good to um, cue activating your hamstrings. So race walking is all about a pulling action. Um, so I will show you it and then I will talk you through. So I've put this one in slow motion because it's actually quite a speedy one. So I wanted you to be able to see what happens. So the, the upper body, the arms are going nice and long. And you're imagining pulling that, that rope in front of you. And from a, a lower limb, your leg is nice and straight. And as soon as it hits the ground, you're activating that hamstring and pulling through. So I'll let you see it one more time. So this one is a really nice one to kind of round off your, your, your set of drills and get your athlete ready for the strides. Um, this one works really well as a transition drill. So doing, say, 20, 50 metres of this drill before moving into a normal race walk. Um, and another thing I'd say about drills is, especially when you're starting out, possibly limit it to about three drills to work on and really uh, nail um, perfect um, because otherwise it can be a little bit overwhelming and just too many too many too many things too many things for an athlete to think about especially with the walks it's quite an unusual uh, technique and takes a little while to master um, so 
I was working with an athlete recently and we started off with the aeroplane posture drill, um, the foot roll, and then this one, the active step. Um, and as soon as she got that right uh, and was confident with them, then we started adding in a couple of other ones just to, to work on some of the areas that she was struggling with. So that's actually the end of that section um, because I know there's quite a lot of contact. So contact content in a short space of time so if you've got any questions on queuing or, or drills please fire away like i said there's hundreds of drills out there so okay guys any any questions there for for bethan or martin or myself relating relating to that i think bethan's point um or your point bethan about getting um, a few drills done very well is is super important i think that's probably relates to um yeah, to run in as well um, for any uh, runner, runner race walkers out there. Um, and also, as you said, mixing up the drills between race walking and uh, running, because that gives you quite a nice blend between the two events. And yeah, I think it, as Bethan said, it helps to identify athletes who maybe could take up the event if they already haven't. Um, so at the moment, Beth, there's no, um, no questions there. Everybody's gone super quiet. So <laughs> we will move on to to the next section. Okie dokie, everyone's being shy. <laughs> okay, so on the next section, I'm gonna talk about strength. So why is it important to be a strong athlete? So it helps to prevent injury, it helps to maintain technique. So as we've already pointed out, maintaining technique within race walking is vital. So you really need to be strong in order to do that. And also it improves performance. So you're not just doing it to stop yourself getting in, injured, you're doing it so you can get quicker. Um, I can give you loads of examples of how getting stronger makes you quicker, but you'll be able to lengthen your stride. You'll be able to put more force through the hamstring. Um, lots and lots of good, um, lots and lots of benefits from doing your S&C. So please don't miss it, um, people that are watching. So what are you focusing on? So generally throughout any, any kind of endurance, so your endurance runners will be focusing on the core, the calf and, and their quads. Um, so with race walking, you want to add in tibant and hamstrings. Um, so tibant is that muscle that runs through the front of your legs, so your shin, and it tends to bite a little bit when you first start race walking. It, it's something that is very, very common. Athletes might not feel like they're challenging their heart and lungs to begin with, but they're definitely going to challenge their shins. So definitely a good thing to work on um, from a capacity point of view and then eventually a strength point of view. And then your hamstrings. So you're really powering with your hamstrings. You want your hamstrings to be able to cope with a lot of loads um, and a lot of repetition. So where do you start? So you want to start with your athletics motor skills. So your efficient movement patterns, your mobility, your stability, your range of movements, your balance, your proprioception. So if you're a coach, head to Athletics 365. There's lots of, it's broken down into lots of different steps and you can move through um, all the way up to gold level. Um, your junior athletes, they want to, you want to work on your general conditioning. So we're talking about like your core and your capacity of your calf calf tibant hamstrings and then when you get to senior level you're probably looking to do two to three sessions a week of strength and conditioning so when i'm talking about strength i'm talking about you starting to to really load um, those exercises so you're doing uh heavy weights on your doing like deadlifts or squats or um back extension the list goes on i could probably do an entire webinar on uh snc and things that i've done in the past um so I won't do that, but I will give you a couple of examples. So I've checked in a couple of pictures. So the man to the left of the screen, he is doing a bird dog. So this is quite good. So once you've nailed a, a normal uh, plank, it's really good to challenge yourself in a like kind of ro rotational movement point of view. So um, any kind of endurance um, activity, you're moving from foot to foot. So running, you're moving to foot to foot. Race walking, you're moving foot to foot. So you want to challenge that rotational movement. But race walking, you're actually rotating quite a lot. So it's really, really important. So you can do an exercise just like that. You can make that one harder by lifting your knee off the ground and hovering. You can flip upside down. You can do it as a dead bug. And you can do so many different variations of uh, core exercises where you're moving your limbs in lots of different ways to really challenge your core through lots of planes of motion. 
And then from a hamstring point of view, so the lady to the far right of the screen, so she's doing a hamstring bridge. Um, so a hamstring bridge is similar to a normal bridge, uh, apart from your legs a little bit further away from your body. So you can do that as double leg or single leg. You can make it harder by increasing the reps from a capacity point of view, or you can start loading it and putting some weight on your chest. Um, lots of exercises. So I've had to obviously do a lot of SNC from home in the last year, as we all have. So I've done some quite nice body weight exercises, um, which actually work your hamstrings pretty hard. So I've done like a, a bridge slide. So I get into a similar position as that, but then slowly move further away from my feet. Uh, they're kind of anchored under a sofa. Um, Nordics are another really good one. Once you've built up a good capacity, ba uh, basic hamstring capacity. So that's someone holding on to your your ankles and you lowering yourself down. Calf, that's probably the one that you all know the best. So calf capacity, simple calf raises, get on a step, lower yourself up and down, three times 15 of those and work up. Um, you can also do bent leg uh, calf raises. So sitting on a chair with a little block under your feet and the same principle, lowering and raising your feet. Um, from a, you can make calf uh, exercises harder by um, increasing the reps or by adding weight and um, if you're going to add weight to a bent leg calf raise you probably want to add a bit more than your straight leg because obviously you've taken away your own body weight um, and you can do isometric holds as well so that's when you raise up and then slowly lower down so lots of variations and lots of ways to make um, exercise you can do at home harder. So the one you probably know the least about, I suppose if you're new to race walking, is tib and exercises. Super simple, a band around the foot. So like that picture in the middle, you need to stick a band around your foot and you just raise and lower your toes. Make it more difficult by increasing the rep or making using a stronger band. Once you're allowed back in the gym, um, you'll be able to attach yourself to one of those multi-gym um, machines and add a, a weight to the end of a cable. So Always think about the future. Race walking senior distances are 20 and 50 kilometers. You need to be really strong and have a really good capacity in order to do those long distances. So it's never too early to start getting strong. Um, so yeah, please, please don't skip uh, S&C day. <laughs> so now onto, I suppose, the main event for most people, the, the session or, or the physiology. So it's something I get asked about quite a lot. Um, Race walking physiology is really similar to running physiology. In fact, it's pretty much the same. The same rules apply. Coaches always come up to me and they say, you know, how do you improve your fitness by walking? Do you have to run? Once your technical model is sound, your cardiovascular fitness can be improved through walking alone. I do run, but I do it more for enjoyment. Um, so, yeah, so I, if you compare my training schedule to uh, probably a half marathon runner so a half marathon runner will do their long runs I do long walks half marathon runner will do tempo sessions I'll do a walking tempo session they might do a, a, a running hill session I will do a walking hill session you get the picture so whatever a running athlete does you can do it walking and it will improve your fitness as long as your technical model is sound so a little bit of a warning here, it sometimes takes people quite a while to get their technical model in a good place in order to improve that cardiovascular fitness, especially if they come in at, with a high level of fitness already. So if you're coming as, in as a senior athlete, a really well-trained senior athlete who also struggles to pick up the technique, it might take you a long time for that technical model um, to catch up with your fitness so you can move both on together. However, you might be a real natural and you might be able to improve your fitness from the beginning. Um, it's always also really important to think stage, not age. So um, you want to set your session for your athlete or for yourself. Um, when you're first starting off, you need to build a nice, strong and aerobic base. Um, so I don't know how much you all know about physiology, but there is a six stone uh, training model. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because luckily for me, uh, Dan Nash, um, who is a physiologist, has already done this. Um, so he's done a fantastic webinar series, Physiology of Endurance Running. And like I said, the same rules apply. So go check that out. And he talks it through in lots and lots of detail. Um, but kind of the takeaway messages are um, when you're starting off, uh, so your junior athletes or, or your newbies, you want to 
build that aerobic base you want to stay in zone one and zone zone two for for the majority of your training sessions are so probably about 80 percent and then when you go to the session days you want to work at the top end of the training model so you're working in zone five so that's like all out effort you want to be doing two to four minutes uh, intensive works you can't talk and then you want to have equal recovery so specialization so within oh sorry before i move on to that um once you've built up that good aerobic base, you can start adding in your steadies and your tempo. So your zone three, your zone four, but you really need to, to build, it takes a while to, to build up that kind of a fitness in order to get the most out of your, your zone four um, training sessions. So your longer kind of interval training. Um, from a specialization point of view, generally um, we advise, athletics advises people not to specialize before year nine and 10. Um, so before that time, you want to encourage your athletes to run, jump, throw, and of course, walk. Um, you want to get them to do lots of different sports. If I use myself as an example, so I, I mean, I obviously started a little bit before this was the kind of go-to thing and the, the advice that was being dished out. But as a, as a youngster, I swam, I played hockey, I played netball, um, I did some trampolining, I basically did anything that I... I saw and enjoyed um, and it wasn't until about year or nine year 10 did I start really focusing in on endurance running and that set me up for a really good base so when I eventually came across walking properly in my 20s um, I had a really um, good athletic all-round athletic ability and was and found it quite easy to um, upskill in the walks shall I say so once your athlete is ready to specialize you want to be moving their training to predominantly race walking um, so like I said I still run but I do it more for fun and I, I, I run up a hill uh, run in the woods especially in the last year just for a little bit of freedom but of my twice a day training sessions it's probably only one or two a week that are running um, and they are the easy stuff all my hard work my long long walks are walking um, so please start to move your athletes towards walking but do it at a steady pace you only want to increase uh, the training load by 10 percent per week um, so really slowly if your athletes running seven times a week for example or or three times a week or whatever it is you need to very slowly um, swap that for walking if if the walks is is the place they want to go so another thing i really like to advocate is integrating your endurance athletes um so you get in your walks your steeple chases your, your 1500 meters your 10k athletes all in the mix all together um so your, there's no reason why your walk walkers can't be included in your endurance sessions especially if you use time-based sessions a really nice example of this was the regional development activity um, that Welsh Athletics put on uh, a month or two ago when we were allowed to have face-to-face -face contact um, so they did a zone five session uh, three minutes two minutes one minutes 30 seconds with equal easy running slash walking in between and what happened was the runners went round a field and the race walkers went round a path that was kind of around around that field itself so all athletes went off the same whistle everyone felt included um and that's really nice and you know there are lots of examples of people doing that um me myself i i've trained with runners doing 300s where we've set off together and they've obviously pulled away from me but we've come back together um they've had a slightly longer recovery and then we've we've set off on the second uh, rep at the same time the same applies to hills I do hills with runners quite a lot um, and then something that my coach uh, up in Leeds uh, Andy um, likes to do is to do out and backs so I think they're really nice for mixed ability or, or mixed discipline um, groups so you set off you go for five minutes you turn around and you come back obviously your runners are going to get further ahead of then your walkers but you return to the line at the same time so it's really nice kind of pace judgment session and um, if you're the one thing to remember is that so first of all as a endurance running coach you already have the skill set to coach a race walk athlete and um, so don't overthink it you already know what you're doing but just bear in mind that obviously it will take a walker longer to get to a certain distance than a runner so if you're setting a one kilometer training session um, bear in mind that how long that that how long that takes the runner and then kind of work backwards for the race walker so say um 
your runners complete 1K in the time, your walkers do 800 meters or maybe even 600 meters, that's what you need to set your walkers and you set them off together, then they obviously they can return together and then do the next set. So lots of ways to integrate. And by integrating people, then you, you kind of ensure that, that they ret they're retained within the sport and hopefully avoid that drop off. So the future, you guys are the future. And like, like I've already said, there are huge opportunities to perform at the highest level within the walks or coach athletes to the highest level. The Commonwealth Games is um, now 10,000 metres and it's Commonwealth Games Birmingham 2022. So if you're already a, a pretty fit senior athlete and you want to uh, transition across, you might just have enough time. Who knows? Um, so please, please do. You never know. We, we might have... Uh, a few surprises on the Welsh uh, team um, but yeah I think even if you aren't looking to get those medals or, or represent Wales or GB there are race walking is a really close-knit friendly community and we're always welcoming welcoming him welcoming to new people so if you think you want to have a go or you know someone that you think would be good then please point them in our direction we're always we're always happy to expand our pool, um, especially within Wales. So uh, thank you for listening and good luck. Um, and my suggestions for further watching, Welsh Athletics has a fantastic YouTube channel with lots and lots of material. You could be there for hours. Two um, webinars in particular. So Liz Davis's Fundamental Considerations When Coaching a Junior Endurance Athlete and Dan Nash's Physiology of Endurance Running 1 and 2. And then if you've got access to Athletics Hub, my coach, uh, Dr. Andrew Drake, he has done a whole series of race work webinars. Um, so there's at least 10 on there. So going all of the things I've covered and more um, in a lot more detail. So please have a look there if you've got access to it. And Brian Hanley, so he's done a race walking biomechanics webinar. So if you're interested in the technique and um, his research, he's world leading. So he explains how his research you can take his research and improve as improve your technique as a walker. So definitely one to, to have a look at. Um, so yeah, so we're back to any more questions. Hopefully some of you got some questions now. Um, I will just pop you all open so I can see your faces. Anyone brave enough to ask us any questions? Now we're at the end. I think we have got some questions, um, which is great. Uh, so, um, first question, um, I don't know how you want to do this, but I will get you guys to pose your question if that's okay. So this, the first one's from Dan Nash. So Dan, I don't know if you would want to ask your, um, your question to Beth, or is it Jemima? I'm not sure which one of you is uh, behind the screen. Both of us. Uh, oh, both of you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I kind of need to remind myself what the questions were now. What did we ask? Um, did you see oh yeah, so, um, if you're in terms of technique and checking on your on your technique have you got any tips for say if you're out on a longer walk where you wouldn't be possible to film yourself but you, you might just to check in and how how you're doing are you making good contact are you landing the straight leg have you got any tips for when you're just sort of out on a training session but you're not quite sure if you are maintaining your technique without just looking at your feet um so i think it simply doing what you just said like focusing in thinking thinking about what it is you're doing especially if your coach has given you cues um so if it's roll low or pull through start thinking about that um what i tend to do is i'll i'll think about in particular a certain part of my technique i don't know my arms lengthening my stride whatever it is i'm working on on the time i'll kind of swap on and off in in long walks so maybe think about it for a couple of a kilometer or maybe think about it for 100 meters at the start of every kilometer or whatever it is so just having that awareness so but you need to build up that awareness first i suppose so if you can have if you do have access to a coach that can help with that if you can start filming it um, and checking back so you know that what it is that you're thinking is actually happening um, but yeah just just think and hopefully you'll be doing the right thing Martin yeah I agree with that it's it's getting the feel yourself of what is right so work when you get the chance to work with the coach do so learn I certainly I very strong in trying to get people to get the, how it felt when they were doing it right and how it feels when it's doing it wrong contact if your contact's bad, you will feel it when you're walking anyway, because you will feel that extra shock when you land. You will feel that going, that bouncing movement. 
So it tends not to be a major problem. You can pick it up yourself. Bent leg, at times it can be harder for people to pick up. Uh, so it's just trying to think for that, making sure you pull your toe up as you're making, just before you make contact so your leg is nice and straight, making sure you can't come working on that. And it is whenever you get the chance, so it might not be able to film yourself in long sessions, but do it in a shorter session if you can at some point, get your partner to film you or whatever, film it, look at it yourself. And if you want, send it to myself or Bethan or somebody, we'll have a look, we'll put, put some comments in. I'm uh, more than happy to do that. But yeah, it's just learn itself what it feels like. And yeah, I think another thing, because I, I coach, coach myself to do this walk from scratch with no coaches around. Uh, so I know how difficult it can be. I think, particularly these days, it's a lot easier. There's a lot of good video online of really good athletes out there. Uh, if you want to look at some really good stuff, me and Beth can point you to some videos of some really good athletes, what are, what are technically very good models, and try and feel for that by watching it, what it's doing, work through it in the house yourself. Step through it, try and feel, put yourself in that position, what they're doing. And just to learn what it feels like to do it. So you can be done. It can be done at home by yourself. It's a lot easier with somebody external telling you what to do and queuing you up. But it can be done yourself. So it's just learning what those things are and getting the feel for it yourself so that you can monitor it as you're going along. Thank you. Great. Thanks, guys. I know you've got another question, but I might come back to you on that one if that's all right. Um, so, uh, Samantha, I'm not sure if you want to pose your question. Hi, I was just wondering whether there's actually any events that you could participate that weren't at high level, like Commonwealth or National Champs or Olympics, um, that you're with other people just to get the kind of atmosphere? Uh, yeah, there's plenty of them. Um, so, oh, I don't even know where to start. There's so many race walk competitions with quite large fields. I mean, obviously, right now, there aren't any. Um, but hopefully as the year progresses that you'll start seeing some picking some picking up again um just off the top of my head there's always an, a good race in, in coventry that's normally about 10k but it does have various distances in it so 5k and and 3k i think they normally do and they do all of those distances as open and you get quite a few people if you're talking about really big fields um sometimes some of the international ones are open so some of the kind of I suppose the, the European permit races, stuff like that. So say you wanted to get that, I don't know, major champ feeling without being in a major champs and that they'd be the one to target. Um, the Isle of Man always has really great numbers. Um, they do a uh, hundred miles, isn't it? Around the Isle of Man. Uh, that's apparently yeah, yeah. fantastic atmosphere. So if, you, if you're feeling brave and you want to go for a pretty long length of time, that one's a, a good one to, to look at. Um, Martin, you got any other good ideas? Uh, yeah, I mean, last winter and then one this winter, I put on some judge time trials, which are really an introduction type competition for some and training competitions for others. So for novices, it's a great way of coming in. You can have a go. You will be judged, but you will not be disqualified. So if your technique is really bad, we will tell you that. And afterwards, we'll point out things to you. It gives you a chance to have a feel without that pressure of, getting disqualified if you get it wrong. So I think those are useful things. Uh, there are some competitions in summary. I'm not sure what we're going to have with the Welsh or what the replacement for the Welsh League. Uh, but hopefully we'll try and see some. I might be putting on some competitions over the summer again on a similar vein, which are more time trials and standalone competitions. So you just turn up, you re walk, whatever distance between 1 and 5k, Try and extend yourself a little bit, push yourself as much as you want, get some feedback from the judges themselves, and just work on improving your time. So they're a little bit like a park runs, but for walkers. Uh, they're not as frequent, they're not as all, uh, regular because simply because I've got to be elsewhere coaching and for races and everything else. But I'm hoping to put more of those on. So they could be a really useful starting position for people. And then getting into the yes, there's lots of stuff open club competitions across England, uh, not so much in Wales, but across the Midlands and south of England, uh, mainly sort of around Birmingham area and around London area. But there are competitions there that you can enter, you can go to, you can travel to a race, and they're more than happy to see you there do that. Uh, 
I was going to yeah. say as well, um, I think I've already mentioned it, but the Welsh and the British senior champs, the atmosphere with those is obviously one of the highest kind of levels of competition you get within the UK. But because they're 5,000 metres, it means that, you know, your top end junior or, or maybe uh, someone who's starting out but is quite talented within uh, the walks can get in um, quite quickly too because the the qualification standard isn't as tough as say it would be for some of the other events um so i'm not really sure but off the top of my head i think the women's uh cut off is 26 27 minutes so if you think about how fast the top end can go so the top end we can go like 21 so it's a good five minute kind of buffer um and then the men's um I'm not, I'm not sure off the top of my head, uh, but yeah, so the, there's kind of scope to, I suppose, compete at a high level um, when you're, you're new to it or, or you're or an improving junior, um, which, I mean, the atmosphere there are fantastic. Um, so as I suppose, as close as you can get to a major games within, within the UK. Um, I'm going to, um, if that's okay, Jemima, bring you in, because obviously you just started um, race walking, haven't you? And you've taken advantage of some of these opportunities. Um, so you've done the, I, I know you've done Martin's race walk time trials, but also mm -hmm. the um, the middle distance opens last year. We put some um, uh, walks in as well. So I don't know if you want to elaborate on your experience on that or... Yeah, so I'd probably say that I was a very keen um, junior middle distance runner and then kind of fell out with athletics for a while and then came back and thought, well, why don't I try a, a new event in a, in a sport that I love? Um, and race walking was a really good, good opportunity to do that. It was the most welcoming and friendly atmosphere for a complete beginner. I've experienced. Um, I've never had so much positive feedback for coming last in a race before, um, which was, you know, it's it's quite scary picking up something brand new in your late twenties. Um, but I'd encourage everyone who's thinking about doing it to give it a try. Um, I was worried about looking silly or feeling silly, and I haven't felt at all like that at all. Um, so I started the first walk I did um, was Beth and showing me literally for half an hour before with um, Martin, um, how to race walk. And then I tried a mile and that was in the Welsh, um, was it the Welsh the Open, race, open yeah. League or something, an endurance race in the summer. Um, and then again, it was nice to see that the indoor champs did had a race walking event. Um, and then um, like Liz mentioned, the time trials and things. And to begin with, I've just, I've tried not to, get too distracted with the the longer distances because it can feel a bit intimidating thinking oh my god I've got to do this for 20k if you treat it like it's a middle distance event and get 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 to grips with it like you would an 800 meter or 1500 meter and even if you just enjoy it over those distances it's as Betha mentioned it's it's like swimming it's just a different stroke um, so you, you, you know, even if you don't want to go and do the longer things, you could still get involved with the sport. Yeah, great, great advice. So yeah, I think, um, I hope, does that answer your question, um, uh, Samantha? Yeah, that's really useful. I guess if you're not looking for it on events, you don't see them advertised and, or know where to go. So yeah, that's really useful to know. Thanks. On the, um, obviously, the, the first place you can um, you, you visit, obviously, we usually advertise the sort of sitting the summer opens um, tend to be advertised on the Welsh Athletics uh, fixture list, which usually then will include what events are going to be or what, you know, the distances are going to be included in that, say, open meeting. Um, what I would suggest potentially, and maybe we can, I can link you with Martin with this, is there is a Facebook page uh, for walkers. Um, and I know Martin, you share quite a lot in there, don't you, as well? Yeah. Um, around, so it might be worth you joining that group um, as well, because there's the, the time trials we usually advertise through that um, and on social media as well. So, yeah, cool, great, thank you. Um, Steve Shaw, um, I don't know if Steve, you want to ask your question to, to Beth Ann? Um, it's probably a bit, uh, it's a bit more advanced for this one, um, Meadow's introduction, but it's just the strength and conditioning side what um weekly session she and what involved she's doing i know she did the basic exercise but is she pushed that on a little bit further and what does she actually do and how many times did you do it really okay so um i do between two and three snc sessions a week um, at the moment my program um i tend to 
do a kind of corset, which I go through three times. Um, I'll do, this is testing my, my knowledge of what I'm actually doing now, isn't it? Um, I do the hover that I showed that. So I showed the bird dog, but I do a hover version of that. Um, I do a hover version of um, a, it's called, um, it's when you re raise your leg to the side, a fire hydrant, that's what it's called. Um, a side plank, raising the leg, uh, quite a few different core exercises, I won't go through them all. And then I've got like a main set of strength um, exercises. So I do a back extension, which I would use heavy weights on. Um, I'll do uh, deadlifts. Um, uh, what else am I doing right now? Um, it's like a single leg squat, um, all with, I don't know, depending on the exercise, like 12, 20. And the, I think the heaviest I've ever deadlifted is like 80 kg. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how much detail you would like to know. How no, that's great. It's basically with the what exercise you're doing because I'm working with Abby and stuff and she's been doing a lot. But it's whether I'm doing the right stuff based on race walking. I've been using general knowledge, so that's quite useful to know that you're doing the same things I have been doing. Fantastic. Um, yeah, if you want to, if you do want to like get in touch and um, I suppose it'd be easier for me to have it all written down because I tend to call my exercises not their proper names. I make my own little cute pet names for them. Um, so by all means, get in touch and I, I can give you the official names for all those exercises and, and actually tell you about the weights and, and the repetitions and, and how I've progressed it. So uh, yeah, that's probably better, a better conversation to have one on one than on this webinar. Great. Thanks, Beth. Um, and, and finally, I think Fiona just wants to add um, add something around the race walking record for fixtures. Um, I don't know if you want to um, elaborate on that, Fiona. Um, yeah, Martin will know it, but um, race walking records and the, and the others will. If you just go on to a Facebook, uh, John Constantinou uh, publishes it monthly and you've got results, but you've also got the fixtures. So that might help people too. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, it's always good to know. I mean, say in, in, in Wales, what we've, what we've started to do, and I think Bethan talks about this, is we started to integrate race walking a lot more into our regional um, development programme. So it becomes a more um, kind of, you know, um, well-recognised event, really. Um, and, and again, trying to, I think Bethan has, has hinted this, the importance is trying to, you know, get race walking as an option for athletes and, and early on in their um you know in their, their athletics careers i suppose for a better word so yeah I, i'd hope to think we're starting to do that in in wales and that a lot of that's driven by the success of you know the the race walks we have had in wales really in in, in, in bethan and um heather so yeah is there any further questions um anybody wants to pose um or we uh yeah has bethan answered everything martin etc Great. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. I mean, thank you, Bethan, especially, um, and also Martin for supporting. Um, really, really good session. I say, if anybody's got any um, further questions or anything you want to bring up, please. Um, I will. What I will do, if if Bethan and Martin are happy, um, please, if you are, happily share. Um, you know, email contacts so you can you can get in touch if there's any any specific um, any specific questions. But yeah. Um, if not, then um, yeah, we will uh, we'll we'll call it there. Um, we'll just check in the that there's nothing new coming in the chat. Um, nope. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming, and um, yeah, I hope to see you all at a future webinar soon. Many thanks. Thank you, Bethan. Thank you. Take care, guys. All the best. <laughs>